Hey Josh, how are you doing? Great. Yeah. I'm so glad. Look, normally we would have about 150 people here, but you realise tonight is the very first episode of the Australian Bachelorette, <laughs> and that's why people haven't turned up today. So you've actually put people off by, by saying, oh, you know what, you can either come to uh, how, do, how do we deal with things when things go pear-shaped, or we watch Bachelorette. So thanks very much for, um, <laughs> because I've got it on speed dial, I'm taping it for tonight. So can you tell me why, uh, why are you here tonight? So. How come uh, you're the expert in this field when things go pear-shaped? I'm probably guessing two things. You're either made a lot of mistakes and things have gone really pear-shaped or you've got some great concepts and models. Hopefully it's the latter. Yeah, hopefully it's a bit of both. Yeah. Look, can I share a story? Please. Uh, years ago, I was involved in a motorbike accident on the side of a mountain. My motorbike was written off. It was feet away from falling over the edge of a cliff. Uh, I got transported to a hospital here in Brisbane. Um, intensive care, I had, I was in full traction. What I'd done is a compression fraction of uh, one of my vertebra and snapped the transverse process off the side of another one. Doctors and nurses around me, physios, everyone, all these experts saying he won't be able to hold up his upper body weight, he probably won't even be able to walk. Mm. Now my friends and family that know me would say I'm very, very stubborn um, and I proved the doctors and nurses uh, wrong. I found a way to be able to, to get up but I was in like an alloy brace for about eight weeks and then had months and months of rehab. And the reason I share that with you is that I've been facilitating now for 20 odd years. I've mm. been involved in startup businesses. I've survived hurricanes and cyclones in different parts of the world. But getting out of a hospital bed mm. when you've got experts telling you that you probably won't be able to walk was probably the biggest change that I ever had to face in my life. And you know, the topic tonight is when it goes pear-shaped. Mm. It did for me. Yeah. Uh, so. I suppose that that's what brings me on this journey to here tonight is that I had to make changes but I've made that what I do mm. as part of my contribution uh, to other people to, to find that way to get that change and get the results. Look and that's what I want to talk about. I, I guess things, people like myself, I like things to be constant, I like, I like things to be, uh, have order but when things go wrong is there a psychology of change? Yeah absolutely. If we, if we break it down most of us don't like change and the fundamental reason we don't like change is exactly what you just said we like order we like things to be the same we like to be familiar with what we know mm. so if things go pear-shaped they go wrong we're faced with the unknown and what that does is it brings up a whole bunch of emotions it brings up all these different premises out of our psychology that gets in the way and we we can't move forward mm. so a lot of people will resist change uh, a lot of people will even go into denial about change mm. And the basic psychology tells us that we're, we're either going to go into denial or resistance initially because of that, that change of what we were used to. Then eventually we'll move into exploration if there's something that aligns with our values or something we can mm. connect with, let alone connecting and engaging with that change. Most people say that there's, uh, there's a real uh, difference between reacting to a situation or responding to a situation. I guess with your first scenario that you gave there, was, was that just a reaction that you, you, you knew that you had to get out of or were you going through a process, which we'll talk about later about what the models have that you've got, but w were you really going through a process or was it just a, a natural reaction to get yourself out of this situation? Yeah, so the, the, there's the balance of instinct, which yeah. is protect myself, but yeah, to be completely honest, uh, I, I'm human, I reacted. The first thing that, ha that happened, apart from the pain and the agony, I don't know if you've ever had that level of injury, mm. but it's excruciating to mm. the point of feeling like you can't breathe and you're completely out of control. Um, there was a part of my psyche that was saying, why me? Mm. So that first part of the reaction, that's that emotion that I suppose we can talk about, uh, about engaging it and, and acknowledging that emotion. But very, very quickly I realised that I had to do something different. I had to respond to the situation. So I had to then start engaging in a process to mm. get myself through that. And it was really who I was being in that situation, not what had happened to me. And my experience in, in behavioural change, it all comes down to who are we being when things go pear-shaped, when things go wrong. Um, I had to take a real good look at myself. But that, you see, that's what's difficult for me because 
if I've just had a motorbike accident, I'm not going through a cognitive process of going, mm. okay, this is who I really am. I now have to go through a process of, okay, where am I? What am I doing? How am I going to get out of this? I'm just working off, like you would say, survival or instinct. Mm. So how do you get to that stage or how do we train people to get to that stage where we just say, you know what? We do have to take a breath and get into a process. How do we do that? So I saw you did one of these interviews with Ben Palmer mm -hmm. um, earlier this month around emotional intelligence. And one of the things that you guys were talking about was self-awareness. Mm. And that's, it is a cognitive process. It's something that we've got to be aware of. But when we talk about how do we get out of that instinctual survival mode, for me in that hospital bed, lying in that intensive care ward and having people moan all night because they had a fractured hip or uh, and just having that in my face was enough to trigger me to get out of the situation I was in and say where did I want to be mm. I had to change otherwise I was going to be a victim to what they were saying mm. I wouldn't get up and walk I'd believe what they were saying mm. so when we bring it down to who are we in that in that time I've since learned who I become under stress what kind of person am I? What masks do I wear when mm. things don't go the way that I want? If you like, we can talk about that. But the cold, hard reality for me was, who am I right now? Who am I being? And what's important to me? Mm. And what was important to me was my family, was my health. And, well, the stubborn part of me is I didn't believe them when they said, you won't be able mm. to walk. You won't be able to get up. I want to talk to you about the, the Maya Briggs type indicator. And I, I guess, you know, we've got a few uh, psychologists in the room here today. Does personality type play into it? Because I'm, I'm probably thinking for myself, I'm a, I'm a feeling or a yeah, feeling slash perceptive type of person. Mm. Would that be different to a person who would be more thinking slash judging sort of a person? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good, uh, good question, Gerald. If we break those down, we say the difference between judging and perceiving. Um, now, oversimplifying Jungian psychological type, but someone who has a preference for judging will probably like more order. Mm. They will like to take action, they'll like to have a plan, and they'll like to see that plan happen. Uh, I worked with a facilitator a few years ago overseas who was very strong judging, mm. and um, things didn't go to plan. Mm. And that facilitator became very, very anxious very anxious to the point of stressed and, and borderline dysfunctional behind the scenes. Of course, we don't show that when we're with a group. So we could say that a judging personality preference will get highly stressed when things don't go the way they plan. But equally, a perceiving preference will start to get stressed or start to get anxious if they lose their options, if mm. they lose that freedom to be able to get the options at the last minute and get it over the line. Mm. I, I relate, I'm more perceiving. I like that freedom, but you take that away from me and I'll, I will become quite stressed and anxious. Mm. When you, you reference, say, the thinking and the feeling preferences, if someone has a very strong preference for thinking, they will be likely to be more analytical. So if something goes pear-shaped, if something goes wrong and people start to get emotional, that's going to eventually stress someone with a thinking preference and mm. they will almost go to their opposite. We flipped that. You, you said your more feeling preference under stress. If I put you under a lot of stress now, you'd probably go to your opposite, and you'd start to overanalyze and start to think, and you'd lose that strength that you have of mm. feeling what's right. Um, so yes, personality preferences, psychological preferences will play a part. Um, we use that when we're working with clients, we're working with people to help them understand themselves. So when you said, "How do I do that self-awareness part?" Mm. The more we're aware of ourselves and our limitations, or even our shadow, who we become under stress, the more we can make those decisions and, and have the awareness in the moment. I need, I need to ask about nature and nurture in this one here. And the reason I ask is that a few years ago, there was a mine collapse, and I think it was in Mexico. And I think there was about 15 people trapped in the mines, and the people who were the leaders had fallen apart. They were so stressed out that they didn't know, but they thought they were the leader and thought, because I'm the leader, I have to be the person who's responsible for getting these people out. Yep. But they were the people who weren't coping very well. Now, I know that's not a training situation, but let's just take that personality, for example. Then all of a sudden you found, you know, old mate who's in his high-vis shirt, who's got his roughed up hair, who just thinks, you know, I'm a bloke who lives next door. I can deal with this situation a hell of a lot better than what the learners of this can. So why I bring up nature and nurture, is there a real part in a person who can learn the stuff that you're doing or do you think it just comes as a natural ability? 
Yeah, really good question. And we see other disaster examples where people get incredible powers. You know, we've seen mothers lifting cars when a child's been mm. caught under a car. Or you say, where does that come from? Uh, when we talked about personality type before, there is that argument about nature versus nurture, and the, the current research that I see is it, it, it's a bit of both. The problem we find is that when people learn too much knowledge, mm -hmm. the old school training where it's just a transfer of knowledge and I download all the textbooks, they don't embody it. They don't, they don't feel it enough in who they are and who they're being at the mm. time. So the, your old mate with the, the high-vis shirt, mm. he'll probably be more pragmatic and just switch into action. When I was in that motorbike accident and I was in, in that hospital, instinct kicked in for me. Survival kicked in for me to get better to get out of that situation. And that's what allowed me to go to the cognitive function. Mm. So does personality play a part in there? Yes, but stress and the stress of change, the stress of when something goes wrong, really muddles up the computer program that's running mm. for us and gets in the way. I've seen, some, I've seen trainers, facilitators, who have made a simple error, have been so overwrought with, em with emotion. So I guess the question that I'm asking here, does emotion play a huge part in how a person responds to a certain situation? Yeah, and I, and I love your question because in, in some of the, the areas that I've worked over the last 20 odd years, people say, oh, that emotional intelligence stuff, uh, that's warm and fuzzy, don't want to mm. deal with it. Mm. Emotions have got nothing to do with it. You, should, you shouldn't address emotions. Uh, what we know now through, through some science studies around behavioural and emotional analysis is, one, emotions are real. So we do experience emotions. Whether we acknowledge it or not is another thing. But emotions serve a purpose. So have you seen the, um, the Disney Pixar movie that just came out? Um, Give me a clue. Yeah, the, um, uh, what was the movie called? Where the, um, Inside Out, that's right, thank you. See, they'll help us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Inside Out uh, portrayed what happens in the mind of, say, a child, mm. where these different emotions actually served a role. And we know that through science. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I was at a conference on the weekend and I had a certain degree of responsibility. Um, I had to hold a certain role at that conference. I was feeling out of sorts. Now, as a facilitator, you don't want to show that. You don't want other professionals to see that. But I had to acknowledge that that was going on for me. And when, when I stopped and cut out all the noise, the emotion that I was feeling was anger. Mm. So you say, well, how does that help you? Well, what we know is that when we feel anger, the purpose it serves is to clear a block that's in our path. So if I had a goal or an objective or something I wanted to get to and you were blocking that goal or something you were doing was obstructing me, I would feel anger. It's a natural response. In fact, I can't control it. It happens. So our degree of awareness about that feeling really helps. For me, acknowledging that the feeling or the emotion was anger told me that I needed to take an action. I needed yeah. to do something to clear a block, but I didn't know what that was. Later that afternoon, we had a session happening and I just, I just got absolute clarity from that feeling of anger that I needed to take an action and move forward. Another example, if you take from the, um, the Inside Out movie, uh, they portray uh, joy and sadness as two of the characters. So I'm probably giving away the plot mm. to some degree here. Um, but sadness plays a significant role in the plot of that movie. And a lot of people will want to deny sadness or deny anger. But when you think about sadness, if someone's feeling really sad and, and withdrawn, what it does is it attracts other people in. So it's, it's actually a healthy cry for help. Misery loves company. Yeah. Mm. Can you give me that support? So mm. do emotions play a role? Absolutely. Um, and if we acknowledge those emotions, it can tell us what we need to do next. Was I feeling angry? Was I feeling upset when I was lying in that hospital bed? You mm. bet I was. Mm. I didn't know what I know now from mm. science, but instinctually I knew I had to do something. And when I listened to that, that's what got me from feeling it in here to mm. putting it together up here. 